what I want to do today is just outline and update everybody here on, on some research we've been doing uh, exploiting um, Reson's multi-beam sonars for trying to understand the geophysical flows across Earth's surface. Essentially, my research group's interested in trying to understand the linkages between turbulent flow, between, between sediment transport here in bed forms in a laboratory environment, and sediment, uh, sediment transport, particulate transport, changing the morphology, feeding back into the, into the turbulent flow features that are then affecting the sediment transport. I'm trying to understand the linkages and the dynamic interplay between each of these components of a, a geophysical flow system is essentially what we're trying to get hold of. Of course, those relationships function across a broad range of scales, um, temporal and spatial, and across a wide range of natural and engineered aquatic environments. Understanding these and, and improving our monitoring of these and the interrelationships between each of them is, is key to better uh, management of these environments. So ideally what we need is a holistic tool that allows us to simultaneously acquire bathymetry, um, a, an understanding of the volume and amounts of sediment transport and fluxes in the environment, and also understand something about the way that uh, sediment is entrained and transported by these flows. So today what I want to do is go through the development of um, a, a new holistic tool based on the, on the 7K series um, for monitoring these geophysical flows. I'm going to show you a few examples of those. Um, and what we're going to do is look at how that um, new tool can help us look at sediment concentrations, examine fluxes across the, uh, the, these flows, and look at bathymetric change over time. Based on the 7K series, um, which uh, the examples I'm going to show you will be uh, how, how we can obtain three-dimensional uh, high-resolution bathymetry, which you're all obviously uh, aware of, but also how we can use the backscatter data, the water column information, to estimate uh, suspended sediment dynamics and fluxes, uh, calculate velocity across the 2D swath, and, and ultimately look at sediment fluxes. And what I'll do towards the end is outline a range of application areas, some of them very recent, um, that highlight the potential that this new tool allows us to, to exploit and, and, and show you some, some nice images, hopefully. So you're all aware of the, uh, of the background of multi-beam sonar systems, how they function, uh, uh, and sonifying a, a swath underneath a, a, a vessel and, and ge geo-referencing all of those motions uh, of, of the vessel to... To, the, uh, to provide a three-dimensional bathymetry of the seafloor. And this is some of the research we've been conducting on large rivers. This is the, the Paraná River in, in, in South America, uh, published in 2008 in, in geophysical research. Um, some more recent research on the Black Sea Shelf, looking at these fantastic flows uh, through the Bosphorus Strait, so salinity flows going across the, the, uh, the, the seafloor uh, uh, in the southwest Black Sea um, <coughs> Shelf. Uh, carving out these fantastic uh, channels on the bottom of the seafloor and a branching distally uh, before uh, moving across the, uh, the shelf break into the deep, into the deep Black Sea Basin. <coughs> and looking at three-dimensional bed forms, again back in the Paraná River, where the, the, the sonars are allowing us to quantify the movement of these bed forms, look at superimposed bed forms to give you an idea of scale. These are a couple of meters high, about 60 meters long, um, in terms of the larger bed forms, flow is moving across the page here. And what we can also pick up is these superimposed bed form features that, that up until uh, very recently we've been unable to really quantify in any detail whatsoever. <coughs> Essentially what we've been involved in, in doing over the past few years is, is more than just looking at bathymetry, but also looking at the backscatter data. So, so looking at the returns through the water column, the 7K series allows us to collect that. And, and then use that to tell us more about the, the geophysical flow environment that we're monitoring. So the ability to capture and post-process this information has opened up a whole range of possibilities for us as a research group. Um, this is one of the first images that we obtained. It's the raw echogram from a, for, for, from a CBAT sonar. And essentially what we're looking at outside of the side lobe interference zone, this is a plume of suspended sediment uh, moving over a mobile boundary, uh, this from the Paraná River, and it allows us to begin seeing the potential of this tool for looking at plumes of sediment moving through the, the, the sonar swath. So when we saw this, we were, we were really excited about the possibilities that collecting this data would, would open up for trying to understand the, the dynamics of these, these flow environments. 
So, of course, in order to do that, we need to go through a range of, of, of processes, essentially controlling for absorption, spreading loss, uh, attenuation, controlling for different sonar settings in different environments, so, for example, uh, the, the, the power that's projected into the, into the water column, the gain, the pulse width, uh, and beam patterns, etc. So, controlling for all, all, those, all those variables. And once we do all that, for, for a suspension of, of a constant grain size and type, so we have to make a, a small assumption there, um, the linear value of the scattering volume strength is proportional to the mass concentration of the scatterers in, in the water column. So by, by conducting a, a simple averaging procedure across the swath width to ensure that the returns are rightly distributed, what we're able to do is relate the backscatter of the acoustic pulse in the water column to suspended sediment concentration. So by obtaining direct samples, we can come up with linear relationships for, for the scattering volume strength to the suspended sediment concentration. Um, and for example, here, the mixing interface of the, the Paraná and the Paraguay rivers in, in south, <coughs> in, sorry, north, northeast uh, Argentina. Well, this shows a, a nice example of exactly how that tool can function and allow us to understand something about the, the flow processes. We have the Paraguay fluid here that's turbid, it's sediment rich. Uh, on, the, on the right, as you look, is the clearer fluid, the Paraná uh, River. Um, and essentially what we can see, even in the raw echogram, is the slanting of that mixing interface in the vertical. So flows coming out of the page towards you, and we can see, we can even see individual vortices on the edge of that shear interface between the two flows as they're combining at this large confluence junction, producing these big large-scale vortices um, uh, and, and shearing uh, um, <coughs> vortexes produced by differential velocities and density gradients across this fantastic mixing interface. So we can pick up that slant in the vertical um, uh, and begin to say something about the way these two fluids are combining. We can go, more than, we can go further than that and begin to control for those uh, absorption scattering <coughs> uh, of, the, of, the, of the returns in the vertical and come up with a normalized scattering volume strength contour for the, for the swath width where we're confident that returns are not being uh, polluted by side lobe interference. And then we can take a step further once we've got that calibration uh, line between scattering volume strength and suspended sediment concentration. We can come up with contour maps of, of the, of the uh, concentration in milligrams per liter of these plumes in the water column. So again, picking out beautifully here the mixing interface between the Paraná fluid and the Paraguay, the turbid Paraguay fluid that we can look at the angle of that, of, that, um, of that mixing interface over time and examine the, the advection of these large, coherent um, vortexes that are generated at that mixing interface between the two flows. What we've also been able to do alongside that development in quantifying uh, suspended sediment concentration is also look at a way of trying to uh, calculate or, or obtain some idea of, of fluid velocity acro across the 2D swath. So in, in relation to that, what we've done is, is developed a, a, a method whereby we can look at the product moment correlation coefficient, so just how well two images or two swath windows are correlated in terms of their SV values across the swath. Grid that and look at the, the differences between consecutive pings to begin to try to track essentially blobs of scattering volume strength through time. Once we develop uh, uh, a, a correlation matrix based on, on uh, the matching those scattering volume strength blobs over time, we're able to get a velocity vector between two subsequent pings of the sonar. And what that allows us to do is begin to put together both the, uh, the, the returns in terms of suspended sediment concentration in the background contours, but also put on top of that velocity vectors of the flow across that 2D swath. So we begin seeing off the bed here, for example, uh, upward motion. So, so there's a vertical exaggeration on the, on, the, um, on the vertical components here. But essentially, you get the idea that uh, upward motion of, of fluid near the bed uh, leads to large plumes moving upwards, put simply. We took some data out in the Mississippi, um, in, in, uh, in the American Midwest, uh, near St. Louis. Um, looking at these large-scale boil features 
uh, that are produced by bed forms on the bottom of the Mississippi River, how they're evicting and moving and being generated over these bed form flows, so how these uh, geophysical flows are, are functioning. So, so if we look at, oops, click off it. If we look at in the lee side of this large structure, so flow is moving down the page here, um, and our swath window is essentially covering this area here. What we've done is rotate the sonar through 90 degrees from a cross track to a long track, so for us to look at the, the evolution of the flow moving across this in, in, in a downstream direction. And what that's allowed us to do is come up with a time series uh, of, of um, suspended sediment concentration in background contours, and with the velocity vectors on top of that. Now, this is a time average of, of around uh, 10 minutes of data, um, showing us that the higher suspended sediment concentrations at the bed, like you'd expect, and we have downwelling pretty much uh, in a time average sense across the entire um, uh, lee side of this large dune, which, again, kind of makes sense. But what we're also able to do is, of course, look at that process dynamically. And this is really exciting development for us because we can start tracking these large-scale coherent flow structures um, across the swath window. And, of course, these things are related to, the, um, to these large uh, upwellings, those, those boils that you saw on the water surface are produced by these large-scale coherent flow structures that are vecting across and over our swath window as we're looking at this flow moving over this large bed form in the Mississippi River. So that's where we were up to, um, <coughs> essentially, in terms of developing the tool. And of course, once we've got this tool, there's a range of environments where we can go out and try to improve our understanding beyond the Mississippi River. And that's, of course, linked into trying to understand a range of process sedimentology uh, uh, mechanics, looking at sediment transport and fluxes across the environment in a whole range of geophysical flows. Um, one of the projects I'm involved with, uh, working with the, um, the, the U.S. Geological Survey, is looking at sediment distribution from the Mississippi Basin, trying to understand how sediment is, is moved and rooted around these deltaic environments in the, in, the, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, and what that means for the way that these systems build up over time, or, or are essentially being, um, um, as we'll see here, uh, flooded due to a range of processes related to how sediment's distributed across the deltaic plain environments. And this, this really does nicely show, taken from um, <coughs> one of uh, Mike Bloom's uh, recent papers in, in Nature Geoscience, looking at the projections of, of surface area in terms of sediment supply, in terms of, of uh, subsistence due to, um, due, due to uh, a range of deltaic processes, so the way the delta's sinking, how sea level's coming up, and how the, the sediment is being distributed radially across these deltaic plains, being key in trying to uh, make sure that these environments are sustainable moving forward into the future. Understanding the way that sediment moves through them um, and through each of these arms of, of a deltaic system, how it's split in terms of water and sediment discharge partitioning, is really key to understanding the way that these systems evolve over time, and uh, uh, as a result of that, key to ensuring that we're able to manage these sites um, for, for the longevity of the protection these sorts of environments pr provide for large um, cities such as, such as New Orleans. Um, and that just gives you a, a, a quite graphic uh, illustration of the sorts of predictions we have at present in terms of the way that the, the sea level rise uh, uh, and subsidence is going to result in, in flooding of the large areas of the Mississippi Delta um, and what that means for, for, for New Orleans and the longevity of New Orleans. Um, one of the most recent things I was doing out in, um, <coughs> in, in, in the last, uh, uh, last summer was uh, uh, essentially hunting for calderas in, in uh, Lake Yellowstone. So trying to understand uh, the sequencing of different large supervolcanoes, if you like, in, in the Yellowstone Basin, and then looking at the monitoring um, uh, the, the hydrothermal vents that are currently operating across within Lake Yellowstone and within Lake Lewis. Um, so this is a nice BBC drama documentary uh, of, <coughs> of what a supervolcano would be like if it went off and, and the sorts of implications that would have. But of course, what, what I'm more interested in is trying to understand the, 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 the geophysical flows of the past and the sorts of features they've produced in the present. Um, and this, this is the first ever map of uh, Lake Lewis, named after Lewis and Clark. Um, it's within the, the, the Yellowstone <coughs> um, Basin. 
And what people are trying to do, what the uh, my collaborators are trying to do that know a lot more about volcanic processes than me, uh, are basically trying to track different types of rocks across the entire caldera system of Yellowstone National Park and trying to build up a chronology of different supervolcanoes over time. Um, and what the multi-beam sonar has been allowing us to do is track those different types of, of, of volcanic rock um, in terms of trying to pit, pit, uh, put together the, um, the evolution of the Yellowstone caldera system over time. So uh, basically trace rock types from, from the land into these large lake basins within the Yellowstone National Park. And what we can see over time, the summary is, is basically that there's, there's quite a lot of debate within the, the geological community about the number of different Yellowstone calderas over time, how often they've gone off as a result of that. And you can see the outline of, of some of those caldera systems here. Um, and, and you can see a large portion of them are actually within the lake system. So trying to get hold of tracking uh, rock types from land into the, into the lake systems is obviously key to try to understand and reconstruct the, the, the former um, uh, volcanic activity of, of the region. Um, and the backscatter, the bed backscatters allowed us to do that, uh, uh, tracking different types of rock features into the lake system and, and correlating those with what we see on Earth. So sorry for the graphics here. This is all, all very much data that we processed last week, or there's a grad student out in, in the University of Illinois processing it, I should say, rather than myself. But it gives you the sorts of idea of the, of, of, of the sorts of data that we're, we're being able to acquire to begin to answer some very important questions about how Yellowstone National Parks evolved over time. What we've also been able to do is, is use some of the development tools that we have been outlining in terms of multi-beam backscatter to look at modern vent systems on, on, on the lake floor. So um, this is a, a nice example of this from Yellowstone Lake itself. Um, in fact, it's from just off the inflated plain, it's called, within the, within the, the lake system. And you can see the sorts of, uh, of activity that, that the sonar is allowing us to pick out. Um, it, in terms of the migration of that activity over time, and also the details of those crater systems on the sea, uh, on the on the lake floor. Um, now, this would have been a video. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work on, on on this on this computer. But what you would have seen is a, a load of bubbles hitting the surface um, with with some uh, uh, some sediment carried up from about 10, 15 meters water depth um, up to the up to the surface. And this is ongoing hydrothermal activity. On, on the bottom of the lake floor. We've got profiles, we had an AUV out there too, and also the multi-beam sonar allowing us to pick up these sorts of features on, on the seafloor. And what we also did was use the multi-beam backscatter um, water column data to try and look at the structure, try to look at um, of the flow coming out of these hydrothermal vent systems using that backscatter information. And again, very preliminary data here, but I thought I'd share it with you uh, nonetheless, just showing that the crater feature in terms of the bed backscatter return, but also this plume of, of, um, of um, upwelling related to the hydrothermal vent activity on, on, on the uh, lake system and the lake floor. And so what we're going to do is obviously use the, the backscatter information to try to delineate the size of that hydrothermal vent system and then look at the, the structure of it and then begin to re, uh, calculate fluxes using the 2D velocity estimations that I've outlined previously for the, 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 the dunes on, on the Mississippi River will work equally as well in terms of a normalized backscattering volume strength correlation trying to track fluxes of, of, uh, of fluid from the hydrothermal vent within Yellowstone floor. Um, other environments uh, we've been working in, in terms of water supply reservoirs, working out in Zilong D Reservoir in, in China on the Yellow River, uh, crazy um, <laughs> water supply reservoir, flood control reservoir that's filling up with a cubic kilometer of sediment per year. Um, and tracking that sediment into the, uh, into the, um, the reservoir system and how to flush it out during big floods in terms of scouring the seafloor, so essentially opening um, the, uh, the, the, the scouring system at the bottom or the base of the, of, of the dam during a large flood is one of the ways to try to alleviate some of that sedimentation that's happening over time. It's one of the largest dams in the world um, and will essentially be full within 18 years if processes like this are not monitored and managed for effectively. Um, and then some other recent research working with Marlab uh, up in uh, Aberdeen, looking at uh, plumes from, from trawls 
um, across the, uh, the seafloor and trying to quantify how different trawls and different gear uh, essentially, um, um, <coughs> essentially results sorry, in, in larger or smaller uh, plumes of sediment off, off the seabed. Um, so, for example, dragging these sorts of doors and, and, and net systems across the, um, across the seafloor and the sorts of uh, roller features and, and doors and the turbulence produced by those, how they produce different types of sediment plumes. So, again, what we have here is, is normalized, uh, have we normalized, no, just scattering volume strength here, so uncorrected at the moment. But it gives you the idea of, of as the vessels dragged the, uh, the gear across the seabed, how we've got these plumes of sediment over time if you like, or over distance, as a result of the movement of these sorts of features across the seafloor. So hopefully we will be able to feed into some management decisions in terms of the types of sediment beds um, that these, these systems are used over in, in terms of marine conservation zones, for example. <coughs> so in conclusion, um, hopefully um, I've, I've shown you uh, uh, some significant potential for, for a range of insights that the, uh, the 7 k zone has allowed me and, and my research group and, and beyond to, to look at geophysical flow processes um, in a range of environments. Um, hopefully demonstrated the use of multi-beam to, to successfully um, uh, put boundaries on suspended sediment concentrations and plume dynamics uh, in, in a range of environments and also allowed us to recover flow velocity over 2D areas and 3D volumes to look at um, uh, fluxes of sediment as well as, uh, as the concentrations. And, and also identified a range of potential application areas for you, giving some of mine as examples of those and the sorts of insights that we can glean from, from these sorts of systems and the data they provide. Um, thoughts in future developments. Generally, what I always get asked when, when giving these, um, these talks at uh, user groups are, uh, uh, what, what, where, where's the future? What, what can we use? Or what can we look to use in the future? What would help in terms of the, the data that you need to try and to improve your understanding in, in your area? And one of the, oh, well, a few of the things that would be fantastic in terms of future development for, for Reson as a group and me as a person uh, in terms of trying to understand these flows is, is a way of multi-pinging. So um, having a ping for the bed return and a ping for the water column. Quite often what you'll uh, need to do in terms of trying to get water column data is degrade your bed returns or, or pollute your red bed returns in, in terms of the settings you use. I, normally you need one sort of settings for the, for the bed and another, sort of, uh, another set of settings for, for ideal water column data and essentially being able to multi-ping between the two would be a fantastic um, addition to, to concurrently collecting the sort of data that I want. Um, being able to get hold of raw, raw, uh, raw data from the actual IQ uh, stave data to allow us to do Doppler shifts on the returns along each beam would also be a major benefit in terms of trying to look at these geophysical flows and correlating the backscatter information in terms of suspended sediment concentration with velocity information. Um, and uh, obviously key within that might be um, producing a system that allows you to code multi-frequency pings. So by being able to uh, um, ping for uh, using a, a set of different frequencies would essentially allow us to, to better get a handle on some of the assumptions we have to make in getting to uh, suspended sediment concentrations. At the moment, we have a fixed uh, frequency, so we have to assume that the, um, the, the grain size distribution and the grain type within the environment we're monitoring is, is um, consistent throughout the whole time of our survey. Um, if we were able to multi-frequency ping, so maybe use a 200, a 400, and say an 800 frequency sonar at the same time, what that would allow us to do is, is begin to um, put to put to bed that assumption because it would allow us to track essentially the grain size distribution of the flow medium that we were monitoring through. So just some thoughts for, for future development of, of the system. Um, with that, I'll, I'll thank, thank everyone for the attention. Again, thank, the, uh, thank Rezon for the introduction and the, uh, the ability to come and talk to you guys today. Um, and there's some follow-up reading there from our recent publications on developing the, the sonar and the methods that, that I've outlined today. So thanks. <laughs>